Thank you, Miguel, uh, and uh, dear all. Uh, is this, um, this pandemic will be forever mark our memories and um, because of, of its uh, devastating effects in, uh, in what concerns all the world, in, uh, in some areas more than the others so far. Uh, Europe remains uh, the epicenter of this pandemic, impacting all countries, but especially in Italy and in our neighboring Spain, but also in Portugal. It is with the deep emotion and the sorrow that I watch every day the un uninterrupted perishing of more human lives and the uh, extraordinary perishing of more human lives and the pressure on our health systems, doctors, nurses, and, uh, um, and support staff, uh, all without ex exception. I think that we are uh, witnessing a very deep and global health crisis, which demands therefore uh, unparalleled responses from the health systems and their professionals, where the main resources and attention has to be, uh, uh, should be focused, uh, from the science and the research, uh, where the hope for a more um, definitive uh, answer for this pandemic relies and uh, uh, from the political system and the public administration to which leadership and command are imposed, but also effectiveness and uh, coordination in the ground. Finally, citizens in general uh, to whom maximum common sense is recommended and above all, caution, prudence and ability to adapt different ways of life. Um, I, along with the, the health crisis, we are also <clears throat> witnessing a progressive economic crisis with the industry partially paralyzed, with wholesale and retail sales almost stagnant and with part of the services also stopped. There is also an ongoing political crisis as there is still a lack of consensus and coordinated actions between countries from which Europe is not at all excluded, on the contrary. Given the international pandemic we are experiencing, the Kaluskul Bank and Foundation um, is temporarily, temporarily closed to the public, but remains extremely alive in its activities. We continue to work uh, hard and daily, now from our houses, homes, from our homes, trying to contribute to a reopening of our society and addressing the underlying effects, effects of this pandemic in the most vulnerable populations. We do this, we do this mainly through the newly created COVID-19 uh, emergency fund which supports different areas as health, uh, health, science, culture and in general civil society, but also maintaining ongoing projects and grant giving activities, giving our grantees the, flexibly, the flexibility that the current lockdown situation requires. On the other hand, we started the Gulbenk and Atom project, as we like to call it, which involves the discovery every day of digital contents in the artistic areas of the foundation 
mainly from our museum uh, with virtual tours and uh, also from the music department with the broadcast of uh, uh, recorded daily concerts. This way, we try to give shape and continue our already existing efforts towards uh, the Foundation Digital Transformation. And more than ever, um, and more than ever, I said, the, the Calus remains an institution that promotes cutting edge thinking and debate around the most pressing and critical issues for mankind. Adding knowledge from renowned thinkers and hoping to show the way forward to the disruptive issues from our future. It's why the Gulbenkian sought uh, through his uh, forum, the future forum, and in partnership um, with the Gulbenkian Science Institute, um, hello, Monica, uh, organized this high level conference, convening some of the most prestigious national and international individuals in the different topics of discussion. I thank Miguel Boyar Maduro, the president of the, Fo the Future Forum, for his excellent work and network that made possible in short notice this web, web dinner. And I extend my gratitude to all the participants and as well as to the team that worked with uh, Miguel uh, in, uh, in this uh, um, seminar, for this seminar. The conference will focus on health crisis, but also on the unfolding economic and political crisis. I would like to finish, to conclude with a message of hope. Mankind has always, uh, be um, able after great uh, climate catastrophes, wars, terrorism, other pandemics, so on, to rise and recover in a healthy and exemplary, exemplary way. I feel profound sadness for all the COVID-19 deceased and their family members past and future ones, but I also believe strongly that we'll, we will hand up safer, stronger, humbler, and above all, wiser with the lessons that we are learning capable to prepare a better common future. Thank you very much. Good luck to you all and to your families. Have a nice conference and uh, Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, President. And uh, as you let me start by thank the entire Gobinkian staff that worked in uh, setting up this conference in a very short period of time. And let me thank to the speakers uh, for their availability and willingness to participate also on a very short notice. And, and let me thank everybody that is listening or that will listen because we hope to record uh, this conference and then make it available also possible with Portuguese subtitles. As the president said, uh, the purpose of this conference is to discuss different dimensions of the crisis brought about by COVID-19, health, economics, in political dimensions. COVID-19 is, of course, in the first instance, a health emergency. And that will be the focus of the first panel. How are we dealing with this emergency and how we ought to deal with it? From social distancing measures to health services responses and the potential and times for a cure, vaccine, or prophylactic medication. But this health emergency already raises questions that relate to non-health issues questions of policy and questions of morality, for example. First, 
why were we not prepared? Was it a failure of science, uh, of science or a failure of policy? Uh, was it, does it signal the uh, incapability of poli policy in incorporating long-term risks into today's decisions? Was it a problem of optimism bias? Uh, what does this tell you about the nature of politics and about the role of science in politics and policy? Second, how do we decide under uncertainty? And the, how does science communicate that uncertainty? All this requires us to rethink the role of science in the public sphere and its relationship with politics and policy. Third, how are we to balance the human cost of contagion with economic cost of the social distancing measures? And what are the possible metrics, if any, for this? Fourth, what, are measure, what measures of social distancing are more effective in epidemiological terms? And how are we to balance that with other principles such as privacy, freedom of movement or property, for example? Fifth, data is crucial to address multiple aspects of this crisis. But how is data to be collected and shared? We have witnessed, for example, the multiplication of academic and scientific networks. It is one of the very good things that is coming out of this crisis. Uh, there are very good things coming out of this crisis. And one of that is the scientific cooperation and the fact that this appears a remarkable hallmark of this current crisis. But at the same time, the organization, reliability, and compar comparability of a lot of this data is weak. And public authorities are still limiting access to a lot of data or granting it only selectively. Open access has not become the standard one would have hoped and expected in terms of promotion of transparency and cooperation. Six, and finally, multiple health questions also raise profound ethical and moral issues. I'm not even talking about the hard choices doctors may be called to do as to which patients to prioritize if faced with limited resources. Think of, the, of something that is increasingly being art for, the need to multiply serological tests to a certain who has developed immunity and should therefore be allowed to go back to work and a normal life. Even something as obvious as this raises profound moral questions. It raises an equity, uh, equity question, as some people will get an advantage over others by being back in the labor market first, particularly for those that lose jobs or for companies in competition with others. It also raises a moral hazard question, as some people might try to get such immunity as quickly as possible, never minding the risk involved. These are only some examples of questions that, albeit at the start being health questions, also raise other issues and can equally be addressed in the second and third panel. This reflects the nature of this crisis. As a once in a lifetime crisis, it's, a, its structural impact will depend more on how we answer to it than about the crisis itself. This answer, how we answer to this crisis, may come to shape our society, economy, and politics for years to come. The second and third panels are precisely aimed at addressing the profound economic and political consequences of COVID-19. The economic panel may try the impossible to make an economic forecast that will actually be right, or may instead actually say that such forecast is impossible because this is a crisis as no other. Everybody accepts that we will have a huge recession, but there seems to be disagreement at how fast can recovery occur. It is also consensual that this is a symmetric crisis impacting on all states, but that its impact is bound to be asymmetric among countries, social groups, and economic sectors. What will this look like? And what measures are necessary to address the crisis and to mitigate this potential asymmetric impact? These are the more immediate questions, but the panel is bound to also address the long-term impact of the crisis. This impact may turn out to be truly transformative. First, the crisis seemed to consolidate and amplify existing economic trends towards remote, remote working, online consumption, and the use of robotization and artificial intelligence. This may have positive productivity and efficiency effects that in some cases may even coincide with increased quality of life or environmental gains. 
Think about the time we spend, we currently spend in sport, in, in transports or business travel and the possibility to spend more time at home. But this is also likely to have profound negative impacts on the labor market and significant redistributive effects. Second, Will the disruption of global production chains be temporary or permanent, and as such, signal the decline of globalization? Will the increase in state intervention necessary to address the crisis also lead to increased state protectionism? Or will the crisis instead make clear the benefits we have so far got from globalization and full cooperation at the global level? In other words, is this a global crisis to be solved through the instruments of globalization, or is this a global crisis that will become a crisis of globalization? Third, will the interventionism of the state disappear once the crisis will be overcome, or will we witness a return of the strong interventionist state, redefining, once again, the boundaries between public power and the private market? Again, these economic questions immediately also raise political issues to be addressed in the final panel. There is an emerging dispute between those that see in this crisis either an opportunity or a challenge to democracies. The optimist group places a good part of their emphasis on the increased support for political elites that an existential threatening crisis from an exogenous origin, such as this one, always brings with it. Part of this, is the renewed trust on expertise. Populism has made instead of the attack on expertise one of its core themes. This, crimes seem, this crisis seems to have revalued experts and science in democracy. And there's been a very effective combat against misinformation. In addition, it is thought that if democracies remain committed to transparency while addressing this crisis, they will ultimately win the international public opinion battle that is also taking place. The pessimist group, those that are fearful of the impact on democracy, point to three different risks instead. First, the perception that authoritarian regimes may have, may, might have been more effective in addressing this crisis further undermining trust in democracy effectiveness. Second, the fear that populists might use the extraordinary powers necessary to address certain aspects of this crisis to further erode principles of liberal democracy and entrench themselves in power. Third, that the fear associated to mobility risks and the selfishness of some states regarding matters such as medical supplies may feed nationalist politics. A good part of panel three debate is likely to focus around these more optimist or pessimist approaches to the political and democratic consequences of this crisis. Another issue will be its geopolitical consequences, including the balance of power involving China, the US and Europe. Throughout all the panels, the European dimension will necessarily be present. In the first place, the European economic response. What the European Union has done already, from increased flexibility on budgetary or state aid rules to the ECB intervention in support of the member states, or the reallocation of structural funds, to what it needs to be done. What kind of economic package is necessary and how to fund it? So far, the focus has been on the later, with two seemingly irreconcilable positions. Those, those that defend the issuancy of joint points, so-called corona bonds, those that defend the use of the existing instruments such as the European stability mechanisms coordinated with the action of the ECB. A third alternative that has been put on the table by people as myself is the issuance of European Union bonds, that is bonds not jointly issued by the member state but issued by the European Union itself. The second question less discussed so far is how such funds should be used to finance national programs, or at least in a substantial part, for a genuinely EU program that will prevent the, distortion, the distortions in the European internal market that will result from the different national aids given to companies. The EU economic response to the crisis will also define it politically. The union needs to use this opportunity to make its added value clear to citizens. Its consensual decision-making ethos is rather ill-equipped 
to the urgent responses such a crisis requires. At the same time, its rationalization role should be put into use in requiring member states to share data and peer learn from their respective national responses. Ultimately, however, it is the nature of EU solidarity and its relationship with mutual trust that will be under the more severe test and may well determine the political future of the Union. It is therefore appropriate that this conference will conclude with the words of the former president of the European Commission, Duran Barroso. We have a terrific set of speakers from different time zones brought together by technology, what shows us that social distance does not necessarily mean actual social distance. We can still engage in conversations and even on a global scale. And to start with the first panel, I give the floor to Monica. Monica, yeah, the floor is yours. Wherever you are, uh, welcome to the health panel of the Gulbenkian Future Forum. So we are living very strange days at very different speeds, where the daily lives of some of us are stopped, but at the same time, others such as healthcare workers, scientists and decision makers see their lives accelerated many, many times to manage and solve this crisis. In the background of Corona, the, the world is not stopping. If anything on the medical part, other diseases continue many unattended, and a large economic and social crisis looming. As a scientist, this is an amazing time where scientists from all over the world have united efforts in a single mission to, to fight this crisis from different perspectives. Institutes like ours, the Gulbenkian Institute, have redirected themselves to help in all fronts under a new emergency fund from the Gulbenkian Foundation, from diagnostics to research. The pace of research is really phenomenal. Everyone wants to know the new facts and what implications they have to their own behavior and to our co common future. As negative as globalization was for the spread of the virus, we're also now used to online tools to discuss with, an amazing, uh, with each other and, and any event, as this one can be now global in a very short amount of time. As a scientist, it's really a privilege to be here today with an amazing list of speakers from the US France, UK and Portugal, all countries actually now affected also by this same crisis. And these speakers have accepted in a unprecedented time, short time to be here with us to discuss the medical facts, the numbers and the science behind COVID-19 and what the future reserves us. So we brought in a medical doctor, Philippe Freud. He is the head of intensive care unit of Hospital Polite Valente in Lisbon. And he's also advisor to the Portuguese Directorate General for Health. He's in the front, forefront in, in the hospitals, actually just came in after working 24 hours in the hospital. So it's really, thank you, Philippe. And, um, and, and he also advises the government. We'll then, after Philippe Freud, we'll have Gabriela Gomes. Gabriela Gomes is an epidemiologist and she's a former member of the Gulbenkian Institute and she's now at University of Liverpool and also at University of Porto. And she'll help us to understand the curves that everyone discusses every day in the news. Then we'll move on to the agent of the disease, the virus. We have a fantastic virologist, Akiko Wazaki. Akiko works in Yale, and she's also a member of the advisory board of the Gulbenkian Institute. And she'll be explaining us what, what is this virus and how can we fight it. Then as you know, there is more to this disease than a virus itself. And we need to understand what is happening in people because different people have different reactions to the virus. So we brought in a, a group leader from the Gulbenkian Institute, Miguel Suarez, who will be discussing the side of the host, the, the human side of the question, how do humans deal with this virus? Finally, to end this session, we'll discuss novel treatments and uh, possible vaccines with the director of the Institute Pasteur, Stuart Cole. So you can find more details about each one of the speakers in the, in the list, in the website of the Gulbenkian Foundation, uh, as you can find their own biography there. So we do not have direct questions from the outside in this webinar, but uh, we actually gathered many questions from many people throughout the world using Twitter in the last day. So I'm sorry if we do not get, have time to go through all of them, but so what, what I'll do is that after intervention, I'll, I'll give uh, time to one or two questions from the other panel members or from myself, depending on the time that each speaker has taken. And also at the end of all the speakers, we'll allow a few, a bit more time for questions depending on the time so that we are on time for the next panel. 
So I would start now with Philippe Freud, who, as I told you, is the head of intensive care unit of Hospital Polite Valente in Lisbon. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Congratulations for the initiative and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be here. And a special thanks to Monica Betancourt Diaz and Maria João Amorim, who helped me doing my slides because I was working. I'm very sorry. I will present my, my talk in PowerPoint. And my talk will be about where are we going? A clinical perspective. And in Latin, we should say, Covadis COVID-19. Covadis COVID-19. First, we must realize that we are facing a pandemic much worse than the uh, flu pandemic in uh, 2009, and much worse than the Spanish flu pandemic 100 years ago. 100 years ago, because this new virus, this new coronavirus, is more deadly and it spreads faster, and that's the reason that after three months of the beginning of this pandemic, of this outbreak, we have now more than 1 million cases and the new epicenter is in Europe. And I think soon we'll reach in Europe 1 million uh, confirmed cases. As you can see, there is, there is different numbers in the different countries, like in Portugal, for example. And we must realize two big differences. First, the countries are not in the same moment of the pandemics. They are in different weeks of activity, and this explains different numbers. And related to the case fatality ratio, we must realize that there is difference regarding the population tested and the way, the way they count the people that die. We are facing a pandemic that is an airborne disease. And this means that the, the spread of disease is transmitted mostly by droplets. And these droplets are transmitted when we talk, we cough or sneeze. That's the reason we should cover our mouth and nose with the tissue when we cough or sneeze. And we must realize that to get infected with the virus, the virus needs to contact our mouth, nose and eye mucosal membranes. This means, for example, if I have a virus in my hand or in my clothes, I'm not infected. I need to transport those virus in my hand to my mouth, mouth, nose, or eye. And if I wash my hands before, I'm not infected. That's the reason why we should frequently wash hands and we no, do not share personal items because we don't want to share saliva. And if you avoid contact with persons who have symptoms of respiratory illness or you keep a social distance of one or two meters, you are in theory and in most of the cases, sufficient uh, uh, distance from the droplets they are emitted by the patients. Most of us are uh, used to listen WHO talking about the importance of testing, testing, testing. That's a very important question because if you test, you find the positive cases and you realize that the positive cases are the tip of the iceberg and you must identify all the cases to uh, uh, stop spreading the disease. But there is a big problem with diagnostic testings. There is a worldwide search, and this means you should adapt your testing capacity to the needs of your country and priority to prioritize. This means, for example, in Portugal, we should use first to test patients that need hospitalization and need to go to dedicated areas for treatment. But even with massing testing, social isolation blocks viral transmission. So we should counterbalance testing, testing, testing with the understanding of the importance of containing, containing, containing. And if you contain, we should expect the flatten of the epidemic curve. This is what we call mitigation. This means, for example, that we have lower peak, lower cases and lower pressure in the national health systems because you have more time to deal with your patients. And if you don't mitigate, you don't mitigate the pandemics, you should expect a pandemonium because all these affects everybody. And we must realize that all the virus in clinical terms do their job. They always do the same. We people must do our job and adapt to the virus. And the worst outcome when we are facing this virus is when we use ignorance, unpreparedness, 
an inadequation of behavior. But when you have a country in lockdown like Portugal and the, the first emergency state started in Portugal in 18th of March, almost three weeks ago, I think we should not expect only to flatten the curve. My purpose is to crush the curve because when you have a country on alt, this means you should maximize the benefits. You should maximize the, the stopping the transmission chains in the community and you should minimize the, the damage. And the damage is related with duration of suspension of activities. This is the strategy in Portugal to care for the patients with the new coronavirus disease, with the COVID-19 disease. This is our navigation chart to face the storm. And the strategy is called 80, 15 and 5. This means that 80% of the patients have mild forms of disease, some of them asymptomatic, and should not go in the hospitals. They can stay at homes under vigilance of primary care. And here, primary care plays a crucial role because these patients are under surveillance by the primary care and they have the capacity to identify the, severe, the severity of the disease very early to identify the patients that need to go to the hospital. And we know 15% will need to go to the wards and 5% will need to go to the ICU. And this is the 5% of these patients that have, have the most most they gave us the most work and they have the worst prognosis probably half of the patients that go to icu probably they were going to die so we need to concentrate our most technological resources in the hospital all these patients need to confirm diagnosis because we have dedicated areas to covid and non-covid because as monica told previously the other diseases are also present and we should to optimize treatment in the patients admitted to the ward to allow uh, non-evolution to severity and to prevent admission in ICU. And we need here to protect healthcare workers. This is a priority. And if you spare on uh, personal equipment protection, you are going to waste in healthcare workers. And here in Portugal, we are involving scientific societies, namely in the ICU to uh, adapt to the new methodologies and the new science and the new evidence. And of course, we need a strong central coordination. To end, and this is my last slide, I, I, I must reinforce that the safety of everyone depends on each of us. So we must fight together to crush the curve. And the miracle in combating the pandemic is not only in the purchase of ventilators, but above all, in prevention. And life will go on after coronavirus, and we must learn how to face the next pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe. Is there any question from another member of the panel? I'll start with one, and then if someone else has a question, I'll go. So actually, uh, at the moment, from everything that you know from the disease and besides you know that elderly people are more vulnerable what can you say about which people are more vulnerable to having very hard uh, disease based on the studies already presented by the chinese and even from italy there are strong evidence to support that the uh, the age is a risk group if you are older, you have a higher risk group, especially if you are older than 65 and 70 years old. And also several diseases are associated with an increasing risk, namely cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, hypertension, and cancer diseases. Of course, immunological diseases also are increased risk, but the ones I, I, I talk about are the most associated with risk of severity and death. Thank you. There was uh, two questions from the Twitter that, uh, that uh, I think are also related to the question that I raised. So one of them was regarding the impact of COVID-19 in tuberculosis patients. And the other one was whether patients with high IL-6 are more vulnerable to this sort of uh, disease, to diseases. In tuberculosis, as you know, we are facing a disease with three months of old, of age, sorry, three months of age. So we don't know 
a lot of the relation of this disease with other diseases. But we know, for example, in countries like Portugal, they have, there is a long past of tuberculosis and these patients have chronic respiratory diseases, of course, they are going, they have, they face a risk of poor prognosis. And regarding the interleucine-6, we know, for example, the, in the final stage of this disease, we have a storm of cytokines. So that's the reason one of the drugs we are using, it's an inhibitor of interleucine-6. We use that uh, inhibitor here in Portugal, in ICU. But is there anything known, because I think that was the question, is there anything known that previous conditions where people already have augmented IL-6 would already allow those people to have a more severe disease? We don't have, in my knowledge, maybe other, uh, other speaker has, we don't have specific knowledge to answer with rigor to, to, to science with that question. Okay, thank you. I think there is a final question that I'll ask and the, that people, you know, I don't know if you want to go into that or not, but that's the question of the moment in Portugal and I think a bit in the world. It's regarding whether people should or no use masks. And I think given that we are talking for everyone, maybe we should have your opinion on that. Yes, uh, I have my opinion on masks, of course. And I express my opinion in the, uh, in the right places before to tell them, tell my opinion in public. First of all, we must realize of course, mark, masks work. If they didn't work, we are not going to use them in the hospitals. First, masks work, no doubt. Secondly, sh masks should not avoid to use the other uh, steps to prevent infection. You should complement the use of masks with the other steps. You should keep uh, washing your hands, uh, uh, cover your mouth and sneeze, and maintain social distancing, of course. Third, you should use masks, but you, you, when you use masks, you should allow that the people at higher risk of, of transmitting the disease and contracting these diseases are always protected. So if you allow other people to use masks, you must always to protect personal health care and disease patients. After that, everybody should use masks in, in places where it's difficult to maintain social distancing. You don't, you sh I, I'm not using a mask in my home, of course, but when I go to the supermarket, I think we should use masks. Thank you very much, Flip. I think we'll move to the next speaker and then we may have more questions at the end. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Gabriela Gomes. Gabriela is a reader in biomathematics at Liverpool, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and also uh, from the University of Porto. Thank you very much for being here, Gabriela. The floor is yours. Good. Uh, so, yeah, of course, it's it's a great privilege to be here, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. And it's also a privilege to be speaking after Philippe Freusch, who introduced a great deal of information that it's needed for for my talk. So, uh, I, I will sh I will share my screen. I made some slides. So, I, I will be talking about mathematical concepts and how we use them to to interpret the the data um, that we are getting on on the on, on the COVID. 19 pandemic. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the primary indicator, number one indicator that we use in mathematical epidemiology is R0. Uh, some people also call it R0, and it's the, the, the basic reproduction number. So the basic reproduction number is a very simple, extremely simple concept, and it tells us how fast the epidemic spreads. So it, we, we can think of it as, as a, a product of three factors. One is the, the number of contacts that uh, a person has per day, uh, for example, if we consider a time scale of days. Uh, uh, D is the number of days that an infected person is infected for. And P is the probability that a susceptible person becomes infected if it gets into contact with an infected uh, individual. Um, so how, how do we, uh, what do we do with this, with this important uh, indicator? So we, we, if we, 
when data starts coming, data on confirmed cases and, and confirmed deaths, are, uh, this uh, data keeps coming. You know, every day we have a, a, a new uh, information about how many people were, were, were uh, confirmed the day before. The, so this figure is actually already updated with today's uh, data. This is in, in Portugal. So we have the number of cases that were confirmed uh, each day, and we construct a mathematical model uh, this mathematical model represents the dynamics of transmission. So it, it, it represents people having contacts with other people and it represents this probability of, of people getting infected if they get into contact with an infected person. And by uh, uh, adjusting this model to the data, we can estimate R0. It's really, we can estimate R0 at, at the beginning, at the exponential phase of the epidemic. So these different curves represent a, a simulation without any intervention, is the black curve, uh, and, and simulations of the different interventions that have been, uh, the so social distancing that has been implemented in Portugal. So uh, uh, I, I implemented these interventions at the day that the measures were uh, uh, announced by the government, and, and I assumed this uh, social distancing to increase incrementally from day to day. So you get these shaded uh, uh, bands in these plots. So the light shade uh, at the beginning, it, 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 it represents the scale up of the interventions, of the social distancing. And then the darker shade, it means suppose that we continue, uh, maybe a bit uh, worrying, but suppose that we continue this intervention at maximum capacity for three months. And then we scale down uh, the, 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 the intervention. So, so we, we ramp down the intervention and then uh, suppose that we have no intervention from late July onwards. So uh, what, uh, the, the, the blue and orange curves represent a moderate social distancing intervention and a, a reduction in contacts by 40%. And the orange curve represents a more aggressive, a more intense social distancing by 75%. So, and there is a crucial difference between these two, these two, uh, they, these two interventions only vary in intensity and they have very profound uh, distance, uh, the, the differences in, in outcome. So when, when we do mitigation, you, you actually, you, you, you attain Immun you immunize the population. So, so as the people recover from infection, we assume that they recover with immunity, at least for the time scale of these simulations. And immunity that is acquired is enough to prevent a second wave if you follow the blue curve with uh, mit mitigation. And you can see on the bottom, on, on, the, on the second pan panel, how this is tightly associated with value of R0. R0 never goes below one, in, in, in this, and, and as long as R0 is above one, um, we are not suppressing the, the epidemic. So, so remember R0 is, is, it represents the number of secondary cases that one infected person generates. So as long as R0 is above one, so we, we have a, a lit epidemic going on. And, and, and with that comes herd immunity. If we attain suppression, R0 actually goes below one. So as, as Philippe was, was saying, we are, we are effectively crushing the epidemic and, and, and we bring R0 below one, we reduce cases as, as much as we can, but the cost of that is that we, 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 are not, we do not attain herd immunity in the population. So if we stop the intervention, then the epidemic, a second wave occurs. Um, the, the bottom panel, is, it, it represents uh, an indicator that is calculated from R0, is, is the product of R0 and the susceptibility of the population with respect to the, what it was before the epidemic. So, um, so, so it, it actually, it, it's, it's, it, it reflects the um, the, the, the slope of the curves. So if, if the, the curves are going up, R, R, this R effective is, is, is above one. When the curve starts turning down, we pass the peak, then R effective is negative. And we see here that when we stop the intervention, when we stop the intervention, the blue and black curves remain 
below one, so we have we don't have a second wave, but the orange curve goes above one when the 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 the, the intervention ends. So we have the second wave. Okay, so, so this is the situation of Portugal. How does it compare with other countries? What are other countries doing? So this is Italy, uh, where the first European country to, to uh, declare uh, COVID-19 cases. And, 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 and we, we see, uh, I, I, think the, 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 I think Italy has, has effectively suppressing the, the epidemic. This is you know, just how this model uh, uh, kind of fits to, to the data. And I think Italy is on way down to, 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 to reduce the cases to very low, you know, to, to, to low numbers and, and eventually almost zero if, it's, if, 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 if the, the, the interventions of social distancing, distancing are, man, are maintained. But if it stops, we are going to have an epidemic that is almost like the one we would have uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think a lot of care needs to be uh, given to how we go back to normal. And, and, uh, and, and we have Sweden. We are always hearing about Sweden. Sweden is doing things differently. Is Sweden, Sweden trying to, to, to uh, follow some herd immunity strategy? I don't think Sweden is, is trying to follow any herd immunity strategy from what I, I, I've been reading and, 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 and talking to people. I, I think what Sweden did was to start, to start a little bit of social distancing very, very early, you know, before, even before Portugal. Portugal also did very early, but Sweden even earlier. I was just reading that Italy started, uh, so Sweden started closing schools on 6th of March, uh, so even before us. And uh, sorry, did, did I, uh, yeah. and and uh, as a result, it doesn't go. The cases doesn't uh, grow so fast, so as steeply as in the other countries. But it's but but, but on the other hand, the, the the intervention, the social distancing, didn't go very intense. So it seems to be following a mitigation strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I just yeah, we just have to keep uh, watching how how it follows. It seems to be on a mitigation strategy. Of course, it can still do the suppression if it decides so and try to reduce the cases to very low numbers. If it follows this mitigation strategy, like like I, I simulated here, it will go to very low numbers and it will not have a second wave. So uh, now I, I would like to introduce the uh, concept of heterogeneity. I, I, yeah, I, I need to go. I, I don't have time for this, I think. Um, so I, I, what, what I've shown you was a very benign scenario. I consider heterogeneity in, in, in heterogene, heterogeneity in susceptibility among individuals. And you get very low, um, uh, uh, you, you get this curve, which is like I've shown in previous figures. If you neglect heterogeneity, you get, you think that you think that the epidemic, epidemic would be much higher. And, um, uh, and, and, and this is not how uh, uh, other groups are considering. Other groups are considering more homogeneous models and without heterogeneity. The importance of considering heterogeneity is that epidemics will be smaller and the, 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 the percentage of the population that you need to immunize to ensure herd immunity is much lower. Um, so uh, I finish by saying that they're just humanizing suppression leaves population susceptible to second waves. Uh, due to heterogeneity, second wave will be later and, and smaller than current projections are saying. Due to heterogeneity, the percentage of immunes necessary to herd immunity is also smaller and flattened epidemics induce herd immunity with less infection. Uh, and and you know, in my view, we should really suppress, uh, like uh, I totally agree with Philippe, suppress now as much as we can and immunize later. Uh, hopefully we'll have a vaccine that will help us to complement the immunity that the infection is already naturally generating. Gabriela, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, we should really move to the next speaker. I just want you to clarify a concept because people may not understand what's heterogeneity. And just very quickly, can you tell people what is that concept that we've introduced in you know, lay terms for people? 
Yeah, people are not equally susceptible. So some individuals are more susceptible than others. And, and usually we, this is very hard to, to, to measure how, how much variance in susceptibility you have in a population. So it's usually left out of models. But I think just because it's difficult, it's no excuse to leave it out. It's really important to include because it has very important consequences. Thank you very much. Uh, we move now to looking at the side of the virus and what is this virus. So we are very fortunate to have Akiko Wazaki from the, the IGC Advisory Board and a principal investigator at the Yale School of Medicine. Akiko, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just going to share our slide as well. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be participating in this very important panel today. Thank you, Monica, for including me. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to focus on some um, virological and immunological aspect of this disease. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Okay, great. Um, so, so today I'd like to discuss uh, four different topics uh, that was laid out by Monica. What, what is the virus and what can history and virology tell us about how to deal with the virus and what can we expect in the future and what kind of research needs to be done? These are all very important questions. So I'll go through this one by one. Um, so what is the virus? Well, it, the coronavirus um, is a family of viruses that infect both human, humans and animals. Uh, corona comes from the word uh, cor crown, which is if you look at the um, electron uh, micrograph of these viruses, you'll see these crown-like structures coming out um, that is made by the spike proteins protruding out of the envelope of this virus. It's a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. Um, and it's really ready to go. As, as soon as the RNA is injected into the cell, it can start uh, making its own virus protein and uh, produce uh, itself and, and replicate and transmit to neighboring cells. It is an envelope virus, meaning that it takes a piece of host cell membrane to coat itself. Um, and that's the spike protein around it is, is a very important um, viral protein that allows for infection of um, cell types that express the receptor. Um, and as I mentioned, there are many different kinds of coronaviruses. There are uh, some of the common cold versions of the coronaviruses uh, that cause about 30% of all colds. And these are um, belong to the alpha coronavirus and beta coronavirus family family members. And there are all these, uh, the um, beta coronaviruses that are have uh, infected and are very lethal in the host, a human host, such as the SARS coronavirus one that emerged in 2002, as well as the MERS coronavirus. Um, and these have very high lethality and transmission rates in humans. So the virus enters the host cell um, through a receptor known as ACE2. And this is a, a, an entry receptor, which means that the host cells have to express this receptor in order to be susceptible to the virus infection. And then ACE2 um, it is the binding for the spike protein for the SARS-CoV-2. However, the, there are other host genes and proteins that are important in the entry of this virus, such as the, um, the enzyme known as TMPRSS2, which cleaves the part of the uh, SARS coronavirus spike protein in order for the fusion to, to occur in the cell. And as I mentioned, once the RNA is introduced into the cell, um, it can really start um, producing viral proteins uh, immediately um, because it's, it's an mRNA. And also the replication complex will allow uh, copies of these viral genomic RNA to be made. And that can be repackaged um, uh, in the, uh, within the cell to be budded and then uh, uh, transmit to other cell types that are around them that have the, the right receptor in the enzyme. So this is um, epidemiological comparison of uh, the SARS coronavirus uh, family members as well as the uh, flu 
And there's a lot of um, misinformation out there, and that's been talked about already by the previous speakers, that COVID-19 is not like the flu. Uh, this shows some of the um, uh, basic reproductive number that Dr. Gomez just talked about. Uh, for COVID-19, it's estimated to be between two to two and three. And then the uh, case fatality rate uh, is estimated from the, the numbers coming out of China is estimated to be 3.4%, whereas the flu usually has 0.05 to 0.1% lethality. And the other thing that's really unique about this particular COVID-19 virus is the long incubation period um, before the onset of symptom. So people who are infected with the virus unknowingly could be transmitting to uh, other people uh, for up to 14 days. And this may describe the, uh, the success of this virus in, in transmitting and um, causing the pandemic that we see. And the other types of coronaviruses that I described before, the SARS and MERS also have uh, um, um, uh, high lethality and, and uh, high basic reproductive numbers, uh, but they were uh, contained because of strong public health measures that were uh, used to uh, really uh, contain the, the spread of the virus altogether. However, for COVID-19, um, it's already uh, too late to, to, to contain the virus. We have to mitigate uh, the, the virus pandemic right now. So what can history and virology tell us um, so if you look at the immunity to the common cold coronaviruses, they do not last for very long. Uh, it's estimated to be about a year. So people who have antibodies to the common cold virus can still get reinfected with the same virus. Now, we don't know what kind of antibody responses are protective against the COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, yet. Um, there are long lasting antibodies that were found in response to the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. However, this level varies between people and it's unknown whether they are protective against reinfection at this point. And there are no vaccines against coronaviruses that have been made thus far. So this is really the history of what we know about uh, these types of coronaviruses. And uh, there's a lot of um, uh, investigation that still needs to happen in order for uh, successfully dealing with the virus. So what can we expect in the future? Um, as we heard already, uh, social distancing measures are really the only weapon we have against this virus at this time. Um, in addition to the distancing, of course, if we can uh, implement massive testing for the virus presence by PCR, and also uh, immune response to the virus can be tested using antibodies to enable better public health management. So if we can understand who's infected and they can be quarantined, and then we can do contact tracing to make sure that people who they've interacted with are um, successfully also quarantined and, and are tested, um, these are done uh, in places like South Korea uh, and uh, have shown success in flattening the curve. Uh, now, now, these types of testing isn't globally available and globally implemented. Um, and, and that's something that we should all be striving to do. Um, and um, we've also heard about social distancing uh, will flatten the curve, but it will not get rid of the virus altogether. Um, and so we need a sustainable plan to deal with this crisis, including um, vaccines and antiviral drugs. Um, and then will summer months bring relief to COVID-19? This is a question that I get a lot uh, because we study seasonality of respiratory infections. So I'll spend one slide talking about this. Um, we recently published a, a review on seasonality of respiratory virus infections. And uh, this is online and available and free to anyone who's interested. Um, essentially in that review, we discuss different seasonal factors that affect respiratory infections, such as temperature, humidity, and sunlight. And these factors affect uh, every component of the transmission, including the virus itself, as well as the indoor environment in which we live. We spend 90% of our lives indoors in developed countries. And so the, this is a very important area of consideration. How do we keep our indoor environment to suppress the transmission of the virus? And of course it has, um, these factors also have uh, important implication in host defense. So what we, um, just to kind of put it in, in, in a simple term, what we found was that um, the airborne 
the aerosol version of the viral uh, transmission can be suppressed by maintaining he relative humidity to 40 to 60% uh, indoors. And this is uh, especially a concern during the winter months when we are importing co um, cold air from the outside, which contains very little water vapor into the house and heating the air to um, comfortable temperature like 20 degrees Celsius. What that does is, is it reduces the uh, relative humidity to about 20%. And that's a, a condition in which the airborne virus can uh, remain in the air and are very uh, um, uh, sort of stable uh, for a long time and long distance. And so one of the things that uh, comes out of this review is to kind of maintain the relative humidity of indoor condition to an optimal level for both virus um, uh, to, to be un unstable as well as the host defense to be properly operating at um, relative humidity of 50%. Okay, and I'd be happy to take questions on this if anybody's interested. Um, so what kind of research needs to be done? Well, there's all kinds of research needs to be done. We don't understand the immune response uh, to this virus, what confers protective immunity versus pathology. Uh, so learning from natural history of infection is critical. Um, of course, having a mouse model or animal model of COVID-19 would be also extremely helpful. But at this time, we have so much data coming out of human population that we can learn a lot from this infection by looking at natural history. Also, development of antiviral agents, um, safe and effective monoclonal antibodies, and um, drugs and biologics to promote disease tolerance, which you probably will hear from uh, Dr. Soares next uh, in his talk, and also the development of safe and effective vaccine strategies. So I will um, just do one slide on what type of immune response uh, are media induced by this virus and what is immunologic uh, protection versus pathology. So these are questions that are being asked right now from the scientific community, and we do not have the concrete answer to any of these questions yet. But some of the key questions to consider are, you know, what are, are the protective versus pathological immune response? For instance, this is a, a, a nice uh, opinion that was published by uh, Yachi Ho's um, group, where she uh, describes a paper that is in, um, just came out in JCI and where she shows that in the moderate case of COVID-19, there's a little bit of increase in the cytokines uh, that shows that the, the body is fighting this infection um, and a little elevation in IL-6 uh, and see a little bit of reduced lymphocyte uh, in circulation, but they tend to recover from this infection. Whereas in the severe case of COVID-19, what is seen in the patients is the cytokine storm, which means that there are huge elevation of various pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, TNF, IL-6, um, that, that are sort of found also in circulation, and a huge increase in IL-6 and other um, inflammatory factors like LDH and D-dimer and so on. Uh, and that may actually be driving a severe case of disease. So um, what uh, is the role of pyroptosis, for instance? Pyroptosis it is a form of cell death that occurs after inflammasome activation, which releases the LDH. And LDH is a strong um, prognosis factor for severity of this virus. There are also cytokines and, that are released. Are they harmful or are they helpful? Um, what is the role of antibodies and T cells? So all, these are all important questions that need to be addressed in order for us to find a good um, way to uh, uh, sort of modulate this immune response in order to uh, make these people better. So I want to end by just uh, thank you. Huh? Uh, amazing lot members. Uh, on the clock to tirelessly not only do research in this area, but also uh, uh, test, start to test uh, COVID-19 from um, people in the community. We're doing PCR analysis as well as PBMC isolation, looking at um, uh, immune response to the virus and, and for the questions that I just posed in the last slide. And uh, I, the, my members are absolutely dedicated to dealing with this COVID-19 and I cannot be more thankful for having them um, uh, to work with me in, in this uh, fight to the pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akiko.
because we are running short on time, I'll go to the next speaker and hopefully we can still find a, a time for a few questions at the end. Thank you very much. It was really good. Uh, so the next speaker is Miguel Suarez, who is a group leader at the Gulbenkian Institute. Then the floor is yours, Miguel. Monica, first of all, I really would like to thank you for um, organizing this uh, amazing meeting. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be focusing on, I'm sorry, I was not sharing my, not sure you can see my screen. It's good now, Miguel, I can Acusa, see. I'm sorry. I wanted to thank you, first of all, for uh, inviting me to participate in this amazing meeting. And um, I want to focus the talk um, on the work that we've been uh, planning to do as part and doing as part of what we call the Science COVID-19 Task Force at the IGC. Um, so uh, the IGC has moved on very quickly into uh, trying to collaborate, uh, trying to contribute to uh, decrease the overload of patient testing uh, in hospitals and protect the healthcare providers at the front line. And uh, one of the main focuses is diagnosis, both by PCR and serology, uh, has been established a very uh, um, strong pipeline uh, in which samples are collected from a variety of hospitals in the Lisbon area. Uh, they transport it thanks to collaboration of several companies uh, and to uh, the IGC, where uh, a number of volunteers actually is working and has been now able to make more than 10,000 tests available for this effort. I'll focus the remaining of the talk on more research and development uh, efforts. And this is really a transdisciplinary effort that fits very well to the uh, Gulbenkian Institute efforts. And a component of it, which is very interesting that I will not be detailing, is uh, based on the background of evolution uh, and uh, research on this uh, uh, subject to try to analyze how this virus is evolving in patients as it goes from one to another, uh, acquiring mutations and changing its genetic landscape in a way that could change uh, its virulence and uh, therefore COVID uh, outcome. I'll be focusing on risk factors and genetic uh, and physiological factors that might help us to explain why there is such a tremendous variety on the outcome of COVID-19. And I'll be actually putting forward uh, some ideas rather than pure facts, but that illustrate where the effort of our institute is going to. So we all assume that uh, this is a zoonotic disease that comes most likely from bats. Uh, once it gets uh, established in humans, once it transposed this huge barrier that is uh, uh, typical of this virus to do it, some of them, uh, now we can transmit uh, from human to human. And the outcomes of the infection, when you see the little dot on the human, it means that it is infected. That means that it carries the virus. But as you will see by the numbers, a number of uh, people actually are symptomatic. That means that they don't develop the disease. While others actually develop mild to moderate forms of disease, which is great because they don't need to go to hospital. Unfortunately, a uh, very significant amount uh, will uh, develop severe and critical uh, forms of disease. And that's the problem for our health system. And even worse, uh, some of them will die. So it's very difficult to put numbers at this point here, but we estimate that about 20%, 18 to 20% are probably asymptomatic. Uh, about 55% will develop mild and moderate symptoms. Um, about 25% will have severe to critical symptoms and about 1.8, 3.5. 3.4% will die. So why is this variation? Um, why are we not all asymptomatic? Or, or, and why are we all not dying? So there's many possible explanations for this. One possible explanation is that the virus changes. We don't think that this is the only explanation. The, only, the other possible explanation is that our reaction to the virus changes. And for that, we need to understand how infected people react to the virus. Um, the most common knowledge and both common and scientific knowledge is that we react to infections, including with these fires, by an immune response. Um, and the immune system actually has the ability to sense the presence of the virus and to kill it in many different ways that uses uh, many mechanisms that we are very well aware of and that Akiko alluded to to some of this. There is an equally important defense strategy against infection probably including against this virus, that actually 
does not rely on the capacity of our immune system to kill the virus. Instead, what it does is to provide some sort of adaptation to the fact that we are infected. And it changes the metabolic function of our vital organs, in this case, for example, um, the lung and the heart and the kidneys, such they can keep functioning and they can keep us alive despite the fact that we have both a virus present and a very, very strong immune response against this virus. So let me try to put a little scheme on this. So this upper part here is the classical way we see pathogens being recognized by the immune system and reacting against and providing resistance to infection. Now, everything comes with a price in life and this interaction also comes with a price. So pathogens have what we call virulence factors that can actually impose stress or damage to these vital organs that I was referring to. But the immune system does the same thing. It's reaction against the pathogen can actually cause stress and damage to these vital organs. Now, there's a growing body of literature that uh, shows that these organs and the cells in these organs, they have a defense mechanism that we, I will refer to as tissue damage control here. And it limits actually the, the amount of stress and damage that is imposed both by virulence factions, by immune pathology. And that provides us disease tolerance, as you can see, very downstream from what we usually look at. So there's mechanisms here they can make our lungs, they can make our hearts and our kidneys keep functioning despite having this very, very strong uh, infection. Now, how would this apply to SARS-CoV-2? And this is not proven, but this is a, a way of thinking about the disease that I would like to expose. Now, one of the virulence factors of this virus, not the only one, it's very popular now, everybody knows about it, is this spike protein that is here. And that's what the virus uses to get inside cells. And it does that by interacting uh, with a locker called ACE2. And fortunately, ACE2 was not invented by nature or is not involved as a locker for this virus. It actually evolved to be a very cornerstone molecule in regulation of physiological uh, uh, functions. And basically it controls the renin angiotensin system. And by doing that, it controls both the lung, the heart and the circulatory system among other things. Now this virus, because it uses this lock, it actually, we think, it's stopping ACE, this molecule, this ACE2, from acting properly. And what it does actually is to favor downstream ear the appearance of all these things. This is not, I'm not actually saying this is the only thing that the virus does, but this is very critical, most likely. It's changing physiologically the host and is imposing some metabolic distress. On top of this, as Akiko said very well, there's something that I dare to call here a COVID sepsis, which is this overt inflammatory reactions. Um, we have already spoke about IL-6, but there's a series of pro-inflammatory cytokines that we know in other conditions can lead to sepsis. And probably this COVID-19 has this sepsis component. And there's yet another component here that actually involves overt activation of macrophages, which feeds this inflammatory reaction as well. Now, can we provide tissue damage control and disease tolerance? that remains to be established. I would like to show you some data that suggests that this is occurring. On the left side here, this is a severe patient actually, and you can see the severe disease here. And this is a mild patient, you can see it here. You can see it at the onset or at the peak of disease. And in this particular study published in Lancet, there's no change in pathogen load, whether you are mild or severe, meaning that the disease can be dissociated from the amount of pathogen. And you can even extend that to other diseases that influence the outcome of COVID-19 in the lower part. You should, we should all be aware that this is an evolving uh, uh, field very, very fast. And there's another study at least that shows different results. And therefore the way to resolve this, we thought that the IGC is to collaborate with those that are in the field and use a, um, a meta-analysis of 21 clinical studies in which comorbidity is being addressed. And we want to see how the pathogen load influences here. Now, very quickly, another uh, effort that we think is absolutely essential and that was alluded to again by Akiko is to actually use a, a full organism to understand how we can intervene. And why do we need to use a full organism? Because this is a physiological disease. And to use a full organism, we need to engineer these mice. The Gulbenkian Institute is fantastic at doing that. Uh, we can either acquire or do it. But then we need to actually infect these mice with a real virus or with a uh, mouse adapted form of the virus, and that requires a huge investment in generating these security level uh, facilities. 
we can then see appearing uh, the pathophysiology of the disease. And we have a long lasting interest at the IGC of using pharmacological agents that we already know can act in the lung and can promote disease tolerance. And what we want here is to identify therapeutical targets that can be used clinically. Now, this would not be possible without a very strong uh, team of people that collaborate with the Gulbenkian Institute, including several hospitals in the Lisbon area. We're very actively collaborating with academia, including almost all the institutes in the Lisbon area and not restricted to Lisbon. Uh, and this would not be possible with the absolute dedication of the IGC staff that is resourcing everything uh, into this. Now, we do this under the very strong leadership of Monica Ptinkovir. Uh, we do this also thanks to several of the PIs, including Moises Malo for Trangenes, Justin and Carlos, which are adding this uh, concerted effort. Karina Xavier and Isabel Gordo, which actually are dealing with aspects of our research that I've not alluded to. Our virologist, Maria João Marin, and Luis Moita, which has been working on pharmacological agents for disease tolerance. And this is obviously done in the context of a much bigger group at the IGC. I would just like to finish by saying that the infographics of my talk are done by Joana Carvalho. And the movie that I showed that I'm going to show again was done actually by Miguel Suarez, which is not me, but a uh, 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 video artist. I will just finish to say that, as Akiku said again, the only weapon that we have against this infection agent at this point is social withdrawal. And I keep saying that we should behave as infected, not only to protect ourselves, but to prevent actual transmission of the disease. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, we will proceed because we have we are really limited on time. We will proceed to the next speaker, who is Stuart Cole, the director of the Pasteur Institute. Thank you very much for being here, Stuart. Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for the invitation. So I'd just like to start by paying tribute to the clinicians and the healthcare workers and all those who are engaged in the frontline fight against COVID-19. You're the real heroes. Um, and I'd like to extend my sympathy to the friends and family of people impacted by the disease. So the Pasteur Institute is one of the world's biggest biomedical research organizations. And uh, so what goes on here in Paris um, is representative of what happens elsewhere in the world. So we're 2,700 people. Uh, and currently we have a task force of 250 working full time uh, on COVID-19. We're also part of an international network with 32 institutes, 32 Pasteur institutes around the world. Um, and uh, the ones in China, for instance, were uh, involved in the very early stages of, de of detecting and understanding COVID-19 and have generously shared their expertise with the rest of us. Here in France, our uh, National Reference Laboratory at Pasteur identified uh, SARS coronavirus 2 very early on, developed a diagnostic test, and this test is now used throughout France. It's an, um, a PCR-based test, which, which can detect uh, the virus itself. Um, we were also able to culture the virus, and we were the first in Europe to do that, and shared the virus with uh, qualified, qualified investigators around the world. <clears throat> One of the main things that we need in addition to the PCR diagnostic test is a serological test, which will allow us to do population-based studies. So as you know from the previous speakers, when, when individuals are infected with sars coronavirus 2 the immune uh, response is activated and antibodies are made. Um, these antibodies are, uh, if you like, a sign of infection and they can also indicate whether individuals have been um, uh, protected against disease. Convalescent individuals have uh, high antibody titers, and these antibodies are not only reflective of the disease, but also could also be used eventually as therapeutics. As you heard uh, earlier on um, from Gabriella, we need to uh, to achieve herd immunity in the population, and that's in excess of 50%, ideally 70% of individuals who are protected. The sero, sero epidemiological study, which we're currently conducting in France, will give us a, an indication of how many French citizens have been exposed 
the SARS-CoV-2. And this information will help guide the um, end of the confinement strategy. To, to obtain the, the, the herd immunity, the best way, of course, is by vaccination. Vaccines have been immensely pop, uh, popular and successful in the fight against other infectious diseases, and we hope that this will be the case with SARS coronavirus too. There are a number of different vaccines, there are probably 40 or 50 around the world which are being produced and entering clinical trials. In Paris, we favored one which uses the measles virus vector uh, as a platform. Um, and one of the reasons that we've chosen this is because the measles vaccine is very easy to mass produce at a, at a, at a low cost. And in terms of uh, a huge, um, huge uh, requirement, this is, an, this is a significant uh, uh, factor. The next steps involved in testing vaccines, of course, are to show that they're safe and well tolerated in individuals and that they induce the appropriate immune responses. As, as we all know, it will take us at least another six months before we have a, a vaccine um, that's ready for use in humans, and that is being extremely optimistic. There is, of course, no guarantee that any of these vaccine candidates uh, will be successful, but the fact is we've been able to identify neutralizing antibodies in the, the serum of um, convalescent patients leads us to believe that we can develop an effective uh, and efficacious vaccine. Now, uh, the uh, neutralizing antibodies which have been uh, identified so far, these could be immensely useful ultimately as therapeutics. We all know, for instance, that the revolution in um, cancer therapy results from the use of monoclonal antibodies targeting uh, particular components um, of the immune systems, the so-called immunotherapy. And so there's some hope that um, a, a therapeutic monoclonal antibody could be developed against SARS coronavirus too. In terms of the therapeutics, obviously at present we have no uh, really effective drugs um, to uh, cure individuals who are infected but there is a great deal of research ongoing uh, to find such, uh, such drugs. There are a couple of promising leads which have come out of screens of uh, existing FDA approved uh, drug libraries. And two of these have gone into clinical trials um, in Korea. And we're looking forward to learning whether they show any efficacy or not. Um, as we've heard from the previous speaker, the, perhaps the most important thing that we need in, in terms of therapeutics at the present time is uh, a series of agents that can dampen the cytokine storm and reduce the immunopathology. If we were able to do this, this would severely uh, curtail the immunopathogenesis associated with sars coronavirus 2 infection because it, as, we, as we heard, it's not the virus which is killing individuals, but uh, a massively um, overpowerful uh, immune response. So that, that, that's a snapshot of activity from, from Paris. And as I said, I'm pretty sure that it's representative of uh, what's going on in other research institutes around the world. At this particular time, it's extremely important that we share information, that we share our knowledge, and that we demonstrate international solidarity, because overcoming uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will require all of us acting concertedly. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Stuart, for keeping on time. I think that was very useful in terms of thinking about the, the, the future. I would like, you know, starting with the questions, I think we have a few minutes for questions, which is great. There was apparently in YouTube a lot of discussion after Gabriela's talk about whether there will be a second wave or not. Mm -hmm. And I think people are alarmed. So I would like maybe Stuart, Felipe, Akiko Miguel also, and Gabriela. Does anyone want to have a word about that? But I mean, this is where if we had new a vaccine which could be developed in that window, 
um, then this is where it, it would really uh, have the maximum benefit in, 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 the, in the immediate near future. Obviously, there may be more waves of uh, SARS coronavirus too. So a vaccine would be immensely helpful in protecting against the, the following, um, you know, follow on epidemics. Okay, I have a question here from uh, one of our trustees, whether what kind of vaccines do you think work better? Because there's immensely amount of different strategies yeah. in terms of generating a vaccine, including mRNA based vaccines. So yeah. Hmm. What is your opinion on that, Stuart? Uh, well, I mean, you're right to point out that there's a whole slew of different vaccines which have been developed using different platforms. Um, most of them use the, the spike protein, which is, attaches to this ACE2 receptor. Um, and, you know, that's, the, that's an obvious way forward. And we also know that there are, that there are lots of antibodies that recognize the, the um, S and S1. So, you know, that's a good way to go. I think it's too early in the day to say which of these particular vaccine platforms will, will uh, be the most effective. Um, the problem with commenting on science in real time is that often we don't have uh, enough uh, hard data and certainly things which have been rigorously tested and replicated elsewhere. So I, I wouldn't like to bet which of these uh, candidates will be the the most successful, but I'm heartened by the fact that there's, there's a whole range of them in development. Thank you very much. Another question which is very controversial is this idea of the certificates of immunity. And uh, maybe Akiko, Miguel, do you want to comment? Akiko, do you want, would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so this passport to immunity idea is, um, you know, it needs to be considered carefully because ha having antibody alone does not mean you're going to be protected from reinfection or that you are not infectious anymore. There are people with antibody that could potentially be transmitting the virus. So I think it's really um, too early to just rely on antibodies to label someone as being protected and, and you know, are not transmitting. Okay. Anyone else wants to comment on that, given that it's such an important discussion at the moment and something that uh, governments have to think about? Stuart, would you like to comment anything? No, no, no I mean, I agree with that, that uh, uh, statement and I, I thank uh, Kiko for advising us to be cautious. Um, I mean, as, as we generate more data and more understanding, we'll understand uh, better which of the particular antibodies um, are, in, you know, are, are useful and associated with protection, but this will require more time and effort. It's, it, I think it's still too early to, to predict um, on, on that score. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just go to a last question, actually, that was raised by by Miguel Maduro at the beginning, which I think it's a very important question also for us scientists and for a foundation like the Gulbenkian Foundation, which is the question, you know, we, we had previous crises with other virus. We've been exposed, we knew that this could happen. So why were, why were scientists and the, the government not prepared for this? Anyone wants to take this one? Are we not investing in long-term research? Yeah, I mean, the global health community has been predicting for years that there would be a disaster like this, and, and now it's finally happened. And we all knew that it would most likely be due to a respiratory virus because these are so transmissible. Um, one of the reasons is not being sustained investment in uh, uh, fighting emerging infectious diseases is, of course, related to political cycles. And another is to do with the economics of it. Most of us think that um, emerging infectious diseases, and many people consider these to be things which are not likely to affect the, the West uh, and, the, and the, the industrialized world. Um, so uh, the pharmaceutical sector has not been uh, very active in this area. There were good vaccines uh, and tools developed following the first SARS coronavirus outbreak but none of these were actually taken forward into clinical trials because the, 
the epidemic was controlled and disappeared. Yes, Miguel, the last word. Very briefly, <clears throat> just very briefly, I think uh, in addition to all these points I've very well taken, I think we, we live in an era that the, the knowledge about biology is focused on very, very few. And people don't really know the basics of what's a virus, what's an antibody, what's a cell. And we need to raise actually the overall level of knowledge in biology massively so that, that people can really deal at different levels from individuals, but even to political decision making. So there's something that we're missing here. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Gabriel, I think we'll have to end here. I'm really sorry. So thank you so much to all the panel members. You've been fantastic. You've done a terrific job. And I'm really sorry not to have more time because I think we could spend at least one more hour discussing. And I had so many questions from people on Twitter and the YouTube. Anyway, so I would like also to thank the people listening to this forum. The forum will be available online. It will have uh, subtitles in the future in Portuguese, also for the people uh, not speaking English. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for making time to be here today. They were really outstanding. Miguel Puyar Madura and the Gulbenkian Foundation for the initiative, which I think it's extremely important. As Stuart said, this is a time for all of us everywhere in the world to collaborate and talk to each other and just make this work and be able to fight this virus. So the next panel about economic rise will start, I think, in three minutes. So just to wait for that and then it will start and uh, have fun and stay safe, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.